Oh, well, it's a, a pleasure uh, to have been invited to the AI uh, JSA um, meeting. Um, it's been uh, kind of a quandary actually on uh, what to speak about. And though my talk will not be so much uh, in kind of broad terms, I really want to come back uh, to uh, the intersection of technology, uh, specifically the you know, use of uh, computation in architectural design and practice. And my own, I guess one could say, a subjective uh, reaction to the advent of these technologies and uh, both Nanico and my participation generationally in those technologies. So my talk will be uh, in a sense, a mix of projects, but also attitudes uh, towards the technology. I guess um, the opening really would relate to um, what we see as uh, a kind of myth around technology, a myth that would see computation specifically as having um, a very strong teleology, a direction, um, which would appear to be extremely exclusive. And so uh, what I wanna talk about today is um, personal in the sense that we were trained before computation and the advent of it in architecture uh, and the ways we have in a sense negotiated between uh, what the computer wants to do and what we want to do. So I'm starting with a um, quote by the famous metallurgist and polymath Cyril Stanley Smith uh, and his views on science in many ways parallel uh, a prevalent, well, actually don't parallel, they actually run contrary to a prevalent attitude um, around computation and the use of computation in architecture. Uh, the main kind of thrust being that many architects are trying to um, treat computation uh, as a science in the discipline. And we are really seeking to, to understand it both as a science, but also as an art. I should ask, uh, do I need to pause for translation or can I continue? No one's answering. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you know has happened in schools of architecture, and you do see it um, to a certain extent in the discipline, has to do with um, the kind of you know the new ways of visualizing data, and then the strange uh, kind of slips in logic uh, around how um, data could be literalized as say the roof form of a building which I you know, find laughable, but it you know, is a very kind of typical uh, slip that architects make. In other words, that they see this kind of quantitative material as uh, delivering reason, a reason behind a formal choice, where in fact the graph or the data could be represented in any number of ways. And the kind of intersection with architectural form is in a way incredibly arbitrary. Uh, and this also happens you know, in the way architects might argue uh, around the functionality of their building uh, relative to kind of building mass and the justification of kind of programmatic relationships. Uh, in general, um, I think one of the drawbacks to a purely scientific approach uh, is that you get a kind of place, a placeless uh, sense of the architecture because it doesn't really involve itself with a multiplicity of inputs, but attempts to reduce those inputs to a limited set of logics. And it then kind of produces uh, this kind of uh, placeless architecture, placeless effect. Uh, and this happens, you know, at all scales, both. So, you know, retail 
uh, to museums and so forth. But it's all justified in a way around a, a kind of scientism. It's not really science. What I find much more compelling, uh, and this is, uh, you know, um, uh, the work uh, on the collaboration between uh, one of your greats, Toyo Ito, and the English uh, engineer Cecil Balmond, was the way in which um, Ito-san deliberately misread uh, the structural diagram that Cecil Bauman sent him. Uh, so rather than uh, kind of materializing the structural bents uh, in the kind of spinning diagram of Bauman, this frame superposition of frames, Ito deliberately moves aside. He looks at the spaces in between and produces a building mass, which ultimately, of course, you know, becomes serpentine, the pavilion, uh, the serpentine pavilion. So it's a deliberate misreading of, uh, you know, uh, one could call uh, the scientific diagram of Balmont. And further interesting, you know, is the migration of that same diagram uh, to an entirely different architect and different project, I believe Sufujimoto actually uh, assisted Ito at one time and was familiar with that diagram and many years later uh, utilizes, goes back to the structural bent, uh, doesn't go with the mass but goes with the structural system and then rescales it and reforms it for the Taiwan Tower competition. So I think a very interesting uh, kind of cultural transformation of technical material, uh, much more congenial to my way of thinking uh, than a pure scientism. So I'm gonna talk about a whole series of projects, but I wanted to uh, kind of list out some of the uh, es essential points that I'm trying to talk about. So it'll be both, um, and I hope I can do this quickly because I only, I know I don't have that much time, but um, to talk about a series of, of design projects and then uh, their intersection with rationality, computation and so forth. So yeah, I mean, the first uh, kind of assertion is that the computers um, are not necessarily smart. They actually, uh, in many respects, can be pretty dumb <laughs> machines. Um, and it really, uh, you know, from my perspective, requires the continuous input of the architect, the designer, to navigate uh, when the kind of mechanism of the computer is doing work for their design and when is actually actively working against them. I would also have to say that, you know, our experience is pre-computational. So we're also, you know, very much involved with craftsmanship and with drawing and all of the kind of traditional practices. And I would see that as a more promising uh, future than a purely teleological, technologically driven uh, point of view in architecture. So this is a, a building we completed, oh gosh, almost 10 years ago, the 014 Tower in uh, Dubai. Uh, it's a 22-story office tower. Uh, I think it was we were involved in that we took uh, you know, to completion that really dealt in uh, profound ways with the intersection of computation in both the design, but also in the fabrication and execution of the building. And so it's 22 story uh, tower, office tower, has an exoskeleton uh, shell of concrete um, and a very light core. And so uh, it works uh, both as a kind of resole and the structure of the building, the primary structure, there are no columns. Um, and also, uh, you know, has uh, certain environmental uh, advantages. So here is a kind of, of a floor plan. I won't go into the design too deeply, uh, 
but it, it's mainly characterized by the column free space, uh, the core, uh, uh, light core and exoskeleton, kind of clear space. And of course, um, a very different way of kind of understanding the fenestration of the office space, the openings uh, and what openings and windows uh, can possibly mean for an office tower. We went through uh, many different iterations uh, of the whole pattern following uh, const structural constraints. So all of these diagrams in a sense work structurally. That is not a problem because it's already built into the constraints. So in a sense, um, much of the, uh, the decision making was more on a cultural level. Um, how one might be able to visualize or not visualize the force flows in the building. And so we went through many different iterations of this uh, using um, a, a, a scripting protocol, working with a, a very talented um, uh, architect who actually was you know, kind of a specialist in the office, Roland Snooks. Uh, who established kind of a rule-based system for working with the gradients. Ultimately, we had a lot of difficulty with the scripting uh, because like in music or as like a musician, uh, we didn't want an obvious reading of the system in play. It was too obvious how the rule-based uh, kind of scripts were working. And so we forced Roland uh, to make more and more and more localized changes to the script. If they were deployed uniformly, we got a, a, a kind of banal or obvious result. So ultimately it was faster, and maybe this is simply the time period, but it was faster uh, to go to manual override, follow the rules, but uh, the scripts were more useful to us in updating the drawing sets and mechanizing what could be mechanized. Uh, but the design process actually uh, using that kind of rule-based system was for us uh, not a worthwhile pursuit. So this is the final uh, kind of projection of uh, the openings in the slab, uh, in, in the exoskeleton shell, it's unrolled and the horizontal dashed lines you see uh, connect back uh, to the slabs. Those are the connections back to the floor plates and the slabs. So uh, there was tremendous success in automating fabrication uh, and also auto automating all of the drawing sets and updating them and so forth. But when it came to the specific design work, uh, we kind of went to a much more direct and kind of manual way of working. There was also a really interesting kind of flip that occurred in the building uh, when it came to the issue of fenestration of glazing the hole. So the, this, was, this is a sketch of the first version of the building where glass was actually put into the holes. Now there were drawbacks to that. Uh, one of them was complexity and cost uh, because it meant working with a whole series of sizes of, of openings of glazing, some of which were on curved surfaces, some of which were on flat surfaces, some of which were on transitional surfaces. So that was a kind of terrible cost factor. The other thing was even the aesthetics of the, um, the window frames and the uh, mullions uh, they were just, for me, you know, too fat. They, were, they kind of ruined the, the sense of the open bony structure. So we went to a second iteration where actually we worked with a standard window wall, uh, which you would find in any storefront that went from slab to slab. It was uh, far less costly. It kept the exoskeleton free and clear. And then there was a sudden consequence to this. Because the window had to be uh, washed, we had to have a meter of space between the glazing and the exoskeletal shell. 
And it was then pointed out that there would be an enormous um, advantage environmentally to that one meter space. So cost and aesthetics actually produced after going through the design process, an environment, a positive environmental effect where you had a, um, what you would call a stack effect, which actually reduced cooling costs by 30% in the building. But it was really, um, one could say it was uh, exaptation if one talked in, in evolutionary terms, it was the byproduct of other kinds of decisions, which once we were informed, we could uh, capitalize on, but it was not uh, you know, the first element of the design. So this kind of evolution in, in a project, moving from cost to aesthetics to environment is completely anti-intuitive, but it actually, it, in a sense, becomes a principle in the way we design. It means doing many iterations and working through and dis making discoveries. So this is a kind of cross section of the tower and kind of diagram of how you know the cool air is kind of brought into that uh, that gap, that meter gap between glazing and shell. And there's a, actually a substantial. Um, draft at the bottom of the building, which is actually quite lovely, especially in a hot environment like Dubai. So yeah, I would say that uh, post-rationalization is actually a very important principle in the way we work, that it isn't something that one could reason out entirely before designing. You have some you know, basic working assumptions but one learns through the design process and uh, a building evolves. This is actually very typical in the realm of invention. So all of these things, the post-it note, the microwave oven, the pacemaker were not purpose designed. They were actually byproducts or accidents that they found uses for. Penicillin the same way. So uh, there is a wonderful quote, which is paraphrased, which is by our, you know, the architect Peter Cook, which is what's the point of designing something if you don't learn something from it? Uh, this is another uh, you know, example uh, more in the realm of uh, you know, the very uh, kind of topical and important discussion around sustainability. Uh, now, uh, United States is in, you know, kind of leads, I suppose, uh, the world in uh, this way of thinking that kind of lead evaluation of buildings, uh, you know, through purely kind of quantitative um, set of criteria. And uh, what struck me uh, when looking at two buildings uh, that both are lead platinum rated that their architecture uh, couldn't be more different. So then the question arises, you know, what is architecture's uh, relationship uh, to these kinds of performance criteria when, uh, when the architecture, you know, it, it, uh, of the, of the uh, Bush Library and the Morphosis Project for Cooper Union couldn't be more different from the standpoint of uh, uh, you know, form and design. So you know, we run into this, I think, more and more uh, you know, that these kinds of desires for sustainability, which are absolutely crucial when it comes to our environment, we're suddenly running into um, a question of you know, how does the specific thing not only perform, you know, in terms of its, uh, you know, sustainability it, in its kind of quantitative sense, right? In, in carbon capture or, uh, you know, the way in which heat is handled, but what would the difference be when it comes to architecture itself, when it's purely kind of understood as a performance criteria? I mean, so you see, um, 
buildings that will stylistically uh, sign sustainability. Uh, but then, you know, there would be other buildings that uh, may not have any kind of green, visible green features at all, which perform equally well. So this, I think also, you know, is an interesting issue, you know, that there really is no sustainable architecture style, which is actually, I think, a really good thing that in fact, it's a purely performance-based criteria and that the form of the architecture can actually take manifold forms. So yeah, I'll go through this quickly. There we work very carefully through the void form and placement of O14 tower uh, with uh, what ultimately were um, waste molds. In other words, they were used once, but they were, we went through a lot of different experiments using disposable and changeable molds as well. And there was a learning curve as well in doing this building. So it took something like two and a half weeks to do the first stories. And then as uh, the construction crews gained knowledge, uh, you know, the construction rate speeded up. Of course, it was never as fast as a normal framed building. But, uh, you know, another kind of phenomena, I think, of this age, and it's already pretty old, um, is this strange relationship between what we render uh, and then I guess the most visibly material state of the building, which was while it was construction. And then it's kind of returned to a strangely ideal uh, built rendering. Uh, this is not just in our work, but I think it almost speaks to a generation of projects. So yeah, I mean, we're very interested in these kinds of evolutionary uh, peculiarities where, you know, a, a moth that has, uh, you know, apparent eyes in it um, become a kind of functional motivator. So I, yeah, I, I kind of created um, a kind of dialectic between two forms of uh, one, which is representation. This is actually from an act, acting theory. Presentation is the tightrope walker who actually is using his body, using forces, balancing on the wire. And then representation uh, is the actor acting like he's doing it. And so I think uh, it's a useful distinction. It's especially become a poignant issue in, in the United States where I believe uh, the discipline has flipped very strongly into the representational side of things and the material uh, has been kind of the kind of material presentational dimension of architecture has kind of received or receded. And so of course, you know, even the O14 tower became a kind of icon, a kind of representation, but that wasn't what was uh, kind of driving its kind of original uh, motivations. Yeah, you can, at the lobby, the exoskeleton sh shell is kind of free of the slabs and really it, it becomes a porous kind of uh, way of moving. And another view from, uh, from the office spaces. So there was a, you know, a very interesting kind of observation on technology actually in relation to um, the uh, sword making in, in Japan by Cyril Stanley Smith, who again uh, is a, you know, a, a polymath and a metallurgist. And uh, there was a perception by the craftsmen making those swords that the hammering of the iron purified it uh, and then uh, converted it, probably they didn't even call it steel, but it was a form of purified iron. What they didn't know was that actually it wasn't uh, the hammering, but it was actually the uh, carbon atmosphere that they were you know, working in uh, from the charcoal that was actually um, delivering very useful impurities to the iron and converting it to steel. And I think at the end of the day, the interesting thing is that uh, as Cyril Stanley Smith 
uh, points out that even the, the kind of scientific breakthrough uh, didn't improve the sword making. They actually were doing it right from the get go. It was simply, you know, a scientific insight uh, that was, you know, made visible, but they were actually doing it right all along. And so it didn't really change uh, the actual uh, material that was being produced. Uh, this is a project that we did for a show actually that Zaha Hadid sponsored uh, many years ago. Uh, it was called the Flux Room. And I'm kind of presenting it because of the strange intersection between a kind of scientism. Uh, I mean, what this room does is it's a, um, a chamber that's covered by uh, solenoids that produce a magnetic flux that project that ma magnetic flux into the chamber. And then we had, you can see those glowing green uh, elements. We had 4,000 handmade needles, magnetic needles on gimbals so they could move in any dimension. And the magnetic flux could then be registered in this uh, deep field of, uh, of elements. So this is, yeah, one of the early diagrams who worked with the Arab uh, the advanced geometry unit on this project. Um, it would have been dangerous too. It actually could kind of, anyway, it was a long process of making and you know, winding the solenoids, making the needles. And then there was an elaborate control system that we devised. Um, and that was the interesting kind of part. Um, no one could really figure out uh, a way of dealing with the uh, regulation of the voltages. And it just occurred to me since I'm an enthusiast about toy trains, that maybe we could use a chip that they use for controlling toy trains uh, for speeding up the voltage, slowing it down, uh, being able to regulate it with a fair amount of precision. And it turned out um, that this chip was perfect. So interesting because the content really didn't matter. I mean, that it came from toy trains uh, was actually incidental, but what it actually was doing was simply regulating and dealing with time, speed, and volume. So yeah, here's the chip. The problem was that we didn't have enough money to have chips made. So this was simply um, used. And so it was an intuition on my part that would work at all. And it worked you know, very well. These are one of the, uh, you know, the, the way we kind of scripted uh, intensity and time. And the intent really um, was to try to mimic the movement of a school of fish, uh, which was, you know, a very current um, in the discourse and the aesthetics of that period. What happened though was completely unexpected. We didn't get smooth flowing uh, movement of flocking at all. What, well, I can go back. What happened was that the, this turned out to be in a contaminated scale for magnetic experimentation because you had inertia, friction, gravity, all of those things uh, working uh, at this scale of, and working with magnets. Um, so scientists rarely delve into this scale. They'll either work at a micro scale with magnetism or something the scale of a cyclotron. So there was a lot of interest purely as a kind of statistical reading of behaviors at this scale. It was the scientific reading of this, but the performance of this thing was not a smooth school of fish, but it was more strangely jerky um, uh, and awkward. Uh, it was not uh, what we had expected. And it, so it produced some surprising results uh, and in a way contradicted 
a lot of the, the ex uh, aesthetic expectations. So working at a contaminated scale in a way is very similar to working in the city. City in, from that perspective for us is not really a kind of laboratory where you have very uh, limited inputs, but you're dealing with a constantly changing set of elements in the environment uh, that impinge on, on the project and that one tries to work with the evolution of a project and have a robust model that isn't reducible solely to a reduced set of principles. So this is the behavior of those needles. Uh, you know, some of the kind of uh, films we took at the time, I apologize, they're pretty low resolution. And you know, it was almost like watching grass grow. <laughs> it was very... So, uh, you know, following on that, um, uh, the famous you know, architect polymath, uh, world designer Bucky Fuller, uh, you know, realized that invention in a way mothers its own necessity. So the Fuller, you know, uh, geometry and structure can be understood, you know, both at the scale of the atom uh, but also can be used, you know, for the, uh, the recognizable domes, the toys, um, temporary structures, uh, you name it. Uh, you know, a very different way of thinking about um, uh, the use of a structure uh, that would go beyond, certainly, of course, he's interested in uh, lightness and material economy, but uh, these structures find many uses which leads me to a project that we were involved in. This is uh, what uh, Fuller constructed actually uh, in the early 60s at Princeton University. He visited many schools and collaborated with architecture schools. Um, and he created what he called geoscopes, which as you can see in this slide, were kind of meant to be uh, dynamic representations of information at the world scale that could be experienced. In reality, because of the limitations of technology, these were more like decals. Uh, but we were asked to design a show for Daniel Lopez Perez, who, was, who did a, you know, a wonderful book um, on the history of these collaborations between Fuller and the and schools of architecture. And in a sense, reinvented the geoscope uh, for his show, we could present everything within an inflatable structure. So the idea was to create a hollow ball, almost like the prototype atomic bomb that was blown up in the, in the uh, New Mexico desert. It was a, a sphere that was covered with projectors and wires. Um, also like a blastula, like a hollow ball of cells but that these would become uh, not only the formers for the hollow sphere, but also projection surfaces. And so it was called the Geoscope II. Uh, the first iteration at Princeton was more like a space capsule uh, that you could go into a hatch and three people could lie down and then projections of the show would uh, you know, go over the inside walls of the, uh, of the sphere. Uh, so this was the kind of the early inflation tests of the uh, of the sphere. So there's an inflated side that's purely an inflatable, and then a semi-rigid inflatable, uh, which carries uh, the people inside, and the two are joined together. So yeah, there was also a, a gel-like padding, a kind of contour couch, like what an astronaut would lie down on. And then this is it's in assembly at Princeton. And then it's final uh, completion at the school. And so this was again, pre-COVID, it was just before COVID. So the students or you know, visitors could actually climb inside, be close together, and then um, look at the materials of the Fuller Show uh, uh, of the book within this uh, kind of capsule. And yeah, all of these were animated, they could change, they were, you know, there was a whole kind of program for the show that could be shown inside. 
It was done in three weeks. It was done very quickly from design to fabrication. And of course, all the constraints of the projectors, their focal length was crucial to get a very high resolution image. So this is the second iteration of the geoscope. Post COVID, we were shown, this was shown at the Venice Biennale with a completely different um, set of participants. So it was no longer the fuller films, but uh, a whole group of invited guests, including Sejima-san, uh, had their work projected in the geoscope. And because of COVID, it had to be opened up so people could pass through, not be too close together, kind of like a cracked open nut. And there was a lot of work again on you know, refining the projection and so forth. And we had a short film uh, celebrating the Seagram building, uh, Mies van der Rohe and the now enemy Philip Johnson. And here's a short walk around. We were dressed appropriately as ground crew from the Mercury uh, Mercury program. I'll move on. And it was uh, wildly interpreted in terms of its meanings. Uh, you know, people thought it was related to the um, the COVID virus, or yeah, you know, all of uh, you know, myriad meanings were kind of attached to what was essentially a technical object. And so, in a way, the meaning is transient. The the physics was more or less fixed, but like the um, uh, the return of the uh, of the Argonauts or um, in Moby Dick, the Pico, there was constantly a changing object and a changing set of meanings attached to this thing. In a way, uh, you know, inspired by what we learned when we worked for a short time uh, on a Disney project, which we never got, but we got the secret of their rides, which was essentially that the rides was a physic, uh, the ride itself is a physics engine, and then the content is periodically stripped out and replaced. So you've got a kind of um, physics slash narrative just in the way people are shunted and moved around a ride, and then you could attach, you know, Spider Man or Buzz Lightyear or Peter Pan or the Little Mermaid uh, content to this physics engine. So what we are designing in a way is the physics engine. Uh, that also led to refinements in the next version, which we're going to try to premiere next year in Tokyo, actually. Uh, our original geoscope had a uniform wall thickness. Uh, didn't like that for this new iteration. I wanted a thinner wall, a more elegant wall. And that then set up a whole set of problems for focal length. So we went through a lot of iterations using mirrors, bouncing them off, and finally following a kind of logic like Occam's razor, the simplest solution is always the best. Um, we came to a uh, way of just mounting the projectors at different distances in order to get the focus. And in doing so created a kind of cute object that the portholes had to enlarge the farther away a camera was. So what started as a somewhat cute object got cuter because of the technical constraints. So yeah, kind of following on that, you know, trying to kind of work and to make, be receptive to the change in the design and to the constraints is really important. 
Uh, this is our Taipei Music Center, which was just completed. Um, and I'll try to go through it quickly because it really, in a way, dealt with, uh, you know, is a large project, an urban design project first, uh, and then an architecture project. And it went, underwent many changes from the initial concept. It was really unrecognizable from competition to the final building, but we had certain uh, elements which persisted which were robust enough to take all of the different demands of the city, the, the music industry who are also involved, the culture bureau, all of these uh, so-called stakeholders uh, were working continuously with them. And so it was not a matter of like holding on to initial first principles, but to have a design model that was robust enough to withstand change and to react to change. So it, just in, in short, it's a, um, a precinct of city uh, dedicated to the music industry. There's a main hall of 5,000 seats. Uh, then on the other side of the street and connected by a bridge, there's a hall of fame and museum. There are five live houses or clubs, a large outdoor performance space, and then an ind industry shell where music is uh, recorded and processed. So it's really a kind of um, a dedicated portion of the city, which had to work in the city, but also be uh, both themed and perform for the music industry. So this was our competition scheme, which as I kind of mentioned is radically different. There was a kind of mobile, um, it was up on a plinth, there was a mobile stage, uh, which changed geometry and kind of to connect to uh, uh, changing scales of audiences and public space and a very different kind of form for the theater and the uh, industry building, which then was kind of completely changed uh, in the year and a half of work. But, there were other competitors as well, uh, most of whom based their schemes on a constraint that the jury ignored. So uh, there was a very strong constraint about um, noise in Taipei. And so almost all of the competitors uh, decided to house their outdoor performance space inside. They basically um, turned what could be an urban project into a miniature urbanism a la Rem Koolhaas, where you had uh, a city in a building. But of course, a city in a building is not the city, ultimately, it's more a representation of the city, and it closes down. And in that respect, you know, the neighborhood becomes dead if there isn't a performance involved. So we decided with our scheme, even the earliest scheme, that we had to use the whole site and that it was uh, not about a representation of the city, but it was the city, it was kind of directly urban. So yeah, this was one of the, the very interesting Toyoito scheme, uh, which was called Tube and Dock, but again, was heavily determined by um, the acoustical code that the jury was essentially indifferent to. One of the things that we were aware of at that time was that this music center, you know, was as, it was in, as important on media that people recognize it and it be internationally understood or even that many of the people would probably never, who, who kind of experienced it would actually never visit. So uh, we presented it in that way, the how it would be shown on the news, how it would be shown through this uh, kind of media, but it was before social media. Then the project actually, you know, as the project took 10 years, social media became incredibly important. And, you know, what was maybe more constrained to the televisual suddenly became exploded. And so, yeah, we, the argument was that this uh, site was not only a piece, you know, a, for performance, but it would also be an everyday part of the city. 
and this these are you know this is constantly being churned out now but um, you know social media has completely taken over uh, the way the project is presented and represented and the way groups and the public you know use the space is continuously kind of projected to the world and it's even used by you know individuals to kind of elevate their own image next to the architecture there were also things about the project which got you know unfortunately covered up this was a what we liked very much was this vault for the press room uh, which unfortunately um, got a ceiling, a cheap ceiling hung into it uh, and was covered up. So there were all kinds of things that happened in the process, which I would say were partially controllable by us. Another view of that press room, we would have much preferred the raw concrete and the rib vault, uh, but yeah, so goes it. Anyway, there were also things that connected us back to my one of my um, teachers and employers, Aldo Rossi, who argued, you know, about the persistence of urban form. And so he loved to relate the way the Circus Agonalis in Rome uh, 1500 years ago mutated into the Piazza Navona. So uh, that open circus space still exists as the piazza and all of the elevated seating, of course, was replaced by building fabric. But nevertheless, that form persists in the city uh, and, you know, has an effect on the way it's planned. And so we argued that we also designed a circus for our open public space, that that kind of transformation could be speeded up. So in other words, it actually acts as a circus when it's an outdoor performance space, like a Roman space. Uh, but then during the day, it acts more like the Piazza Navona. So uh, in a way, compressing that logic even to you know, a building uh, of the present. So they're, they're very important that the object elements of the project be on an elevated horizon of fabric and that that fabric would actually have an expression. It wouldn't be generic, but these objects would be visible from any point. And we were super interested in the silhouette of the building, both the ground form, but also the way uh, the silhouette of the building reads against the sky. So inspired by, of course, uh, Japanese architecture and uh, Kurosawa's films, but also, you know, uh, seeing this as a kind of strange object vehicle, both connected to a ground, but also distinct from it. The building is actually, uh, the, the main hall is a 5,000 seat concert hall, which is the same, essentially the same plan form and program as Bernard Schumi's Limoges concert hall. It's a fan-shaped hall, but we took a very different kind of approach to the face of the building that it would actually be both a groundwork built into an artificial hill and then the object building that, you know, sits on top of it, kind of working with a new horizon for the building rather than trying to kind of wrap the building, uh, you know, with a kind of arc-shaped form, which is what uh, Bernard Schumi did, but it's actually a very similar kind of theater. And also very interested in the way, you know, we would use corrugated and uh, standing scene uh, paneling. This is the decking before uh, the uh, cladding went on, the kind of steel decking. And you know it does, in a sense, mimic the outer, the landscape around the projects. It's a very interesting site that you know Taipei has no suburbs, so industry, a former industrial area, goes right up against fairly unchanged nature, which uh, you know was really exciting. And that was the kind of contextualism that we were interested in. Not uh, it would be a waste of time to kind of repeat an industrial aesthetic. But very interesting, you know, this relationship to the nature around the site. And I was also interested in this kind of finish, um, which 
is character, actually it's a form of anodizing that was invented in Japan um, in the early part of the century. And I'm sure it's probably a nostalgic finish at this point uh, for teapots and lunch boxes and so forth. I don't even know how much it's used anymore. It was also used on this elegant um, Mitsubishi fighter plane, which had very interesting uh, ways of reflecting the light and also camouflaging itself against sea and sky. And so I thought this would be a perfect kind of uh, color and finish to use on the main hall. Also the, you know, you, the way in which um, what could be considered kind of cheap materials could be crafted beautifully. This is actually a Junkers uh, transport plane, but the way in which windows are detailed or corners are, are turned with a double corrugation uh, was fascinating to me, or also how more complex forms could be uh, clad using a directional material. So I'll flash through, I think I'm taking far too long with this lecture. This is the kind of main hall interior, the, an initial performance. View of that outdoor performance space and the cube, which is a, a museum and hall of fame. Okay, yeah, I'm going to do, I, I guess I'll describe this last project, which will be completed uh, next year. And I'll try to go through it quickly because I know I'm running too late. Uh, this is the Kaohsiung port terminal. And uh, I want to, you know, in a way, talk about the way in which we kind of think of architectural form. We literally redeployed the trilobe that we used in our first scheme as a port terminal. And essentially, the, my argument is that if a theater is used to uh, focus attention to a point, we essentially could use the same building and reverse the arrows. So the trilobe got changed, of course, relative to a tower, uh, and the orientation of the lobes then correlated now to cruise ships um, and ferries, but essentially the same diagram could be used simply by reversing the, um, the projection, the, the way of looking instead of inward, look outward. And that relates to a whole legacy of work on this morphology that we've been doing since the early 90s. So there's a persistence to the formal uh, investigation that cuts across sites and programs and scales. So yeah, I mean, the, the initial connection would be to uh, figures like Melnikov, who did the Rusikov Workers Club, and then other uh, you know, um, theatrical forms. Uh, but then we found through the transformation of that morphology and the reconsideration of views that it worked perfectly well for the terminal as well. So it's, you know, part of a network of cruise ships uh, and systems that, you know, connect to Japan and Korea and, and uh, possibly to China if the situation improves. <laughs> um, this is the site. It's actually uh, Kaohsiung Harbor. Um, which has an incredible history going back. It was really initially constructed uh, by Japan and it was one of the uh, kind of major bases for the uh, Japanese Navy uh, from the early 1930s you know, to the end of the Second World War. So our precise site uh, was a tank farm. And so going back here, before we had to construct we actually had to remediate the site. There was literally a lake of oil uh, 
under the site that had to be uh, pumped out and then all the soil replaced as well. So there was a kind of deep material history uh, from the Mitsubishi tanks, uh, later on after the war, it became China petroleum tanks. And then finally, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, they considered this site for their new port of authority tower and terminal. And there were even photographs that I actually found from the US Navy for targeting maps uh, to bomb <laughs> those tanks, those Mitsubishi tanks. So there's an incredible kind of record of the history and even the bombing. Anyway, uh, that aside, the deep history, the deep material history still exists. It's also a, not a post-industrial site, but it's still very much an active harbor. So the way we were thinking about this project was you know, to keep the harbor active and then to overlay public space and the terminal in it. And so it's uh, kind of worked out in a very sectional way. I'll try to go through this quickly. And it was also part of a master plan that considered this building as part of a larger infrastructure, which hasn't yet been built. But again, this is the landward side. Uh, it was a very figural building, almost like a, an exhaust manifold that direct people and views to their ships rather than a gridded space. And there would also be a kind of backflow at another level, an elevated um, pedestrian promenade uh, that allowed people to go to restaurants and shops at a higher level in the terminal and look down at the, uh, at the cruise ship area. So in a way it was like an air, it's it designed uh, very similarly to an airport. and use of uh, poche uh, very strongly. All vertical circulation happens inside the walls to keep the spaces relatively clean and simple. But these are you know, still under construction, but slated to be completed uh, next year. And there were a lot of uh, you know, studies of the cladding, which cladding panels would be uh, complex. We tried to reduce those to a minimum. Most of them are flat, both inside and out. And you know, kind of outdoor garden spaces, which are being constructed as well. And I think this ends my lecture. Again, I apologize for the length. Um, but, well, I won't, yeah, I won't dwell on it. <laughs> okay, thank you.